Believe it or not, this isn't the 2021 Mazda MX-5. It's my 95 Miata, and it is the perfect example of what a simple sports car should be. It's light, balanced, and beautiful to drive even after all these years. This thing just oozes character, and it puts a massive smile on my face every time I'm behind the wheel. Anyone who says they don't make them like they used to, yeah, they think that that's a pretty good example, except they do make them like they used to. And this fourth gen MX-5 does a pretty damn fine impersonation of its predecessor. don't forget to share our channel and subscribe so you can catch some of this and maybe even a little of that. Obviously, we have to be realistic when we're talking about a brand new car and how it compares to one that's almost as old as I am. So remember, this is about the fundamentals and not the features. And here is the key, I think, about this whole thing is that standard power windows and locks are a touchscreen infotainment system, even blind spot monitoring, none of it does anything to mess with the essence of the MX-5. And that is something that this fourth generation version absolutely nails. And this really is a great modern interpretation of the original, yes, my Miata. This really does feel a lot like just a newer version of that car. And a big reason why is balance. Now, here's the thing about weight distribution. You're probably not gonna notice the difference between say 43-57 front to rear split and 45-55 unless you are deeply in tune with the physics of the world around you and outside of a track situation. And honestly, even then, you're probably not gonna notice it. But something that is gonna stand out, even if you're just pushing it kind of moderately on a winding road, is the 50-50 balance of a car like the MX-5. It is like a metronome. So you can add or subtract speed as you need, and it does nothing to disrupt the balance and the predictability of it. That is the key here. It's just very easy to understand what's happening all the time. And the same goes with the suspension. Now there is some of that signature soft suspension here, so it really leans into corners, but honestly, that is not a complaint. Anyone who knocks the Miata for that soft suspension doesn't really understand what this car is all about because it's not sloppy it is communicative that means you can understand exactly what's happening especially if you push it hard into a corner and that doesn't matter whether you're just enjoying a back road or you're out on a track day that really is what this thing is all about but the other thing it's about is getting out and enjoying a weekend away that trunk, well, it's not huge, but there is room for one or two overnight bags. Again, that's what this car is about, getting out there and exploring. And again, the trunk's not huge, but I was able to fit a camping chair in there. And what that means is that if you're going to a track day or some sort of car meet, you can bring a place to sit with you. I think that is really great. I don't think I could fit a chair like that in the back of my Miata. So I guess that is a sign of the evolution of this car. Now, no, the trunk isn't big enough to fit a set of track tires in the back like you can in the Subaru BRZ, but that doesn't matter. That's not what this car is about because it doesn't need super sticky track tires. It is just so nimble, so light, and so balanced. Honestly, even on the stock Potenzas, it has more than enough traction. You don't have to worry about it. Yeah, if you're talking about the MX-5 Cup car, well, it does have sticky track-only tires. But if you're doing weekend lapping or just out enjoying a back road, you don't need to worry about it too much because this is just such a precise driver's car. Now, this one I'm driving, well, it weighs in at about 2,350 pounds because it has the six-speed manual transmission. And that officially makes it lighter than the NC, the third generation Miata. And it's not often you see a car getting lighter in later generations, but it really does just show you what this car is all about, what it was designed to do, and how it's supposed to be driven. 
Mazda understands and its engineers know full well that this is a driver's car and it was kind of getting away from that a little bit with the NC. That thing was just a little bit bloated. So I like the fact that Mazda has given you a bunch of new stuff, but it's made this car lighter. Now, if you do opt for the automatic, you're gonna add about 60 pounds to the curb weight, but you're also gonna take away a whole chunk of fun. And listen, I fully understand that not everyone is able to row their own gears. And the other thing is you might not want to, but I'm telling you right now, if you are able-bodied enough to drive a manual transmission or you wanna learn, this is the perfect car to do it because this six-speed manual is absolutely fantastic. The clutch action is perfect. This shifter is buttery and I implore you to give it a go. Even if you are on the fence, it's not gonna take you long to learn. You're gonna figure it out. Whether you're learning for the first time or picking it up again for the first time in years, do yourself a favor and give this a go. Now it's not quite as easy to heel and toe as my NA, at least not for me, but a big reason why it's just how wide this center stack is. But it does get easy after a little while. Once you get the hang of it, it's not that hard. And you'll be blipping your way around everywhere you go. And this thing sounds fantastic when you do it. This is a two liter inline four. It's not turbocharged because this car doesn't need it. It makes 181 horsepower and 151 pound feet of torque. No, those numbers aren't really gonna impress you on paper but they're more than enough. Don't forget this car does not weigh 2,500 pounds. So you don't need a ton of horsepower and torque to get this thing moving and keep it that way. That 181 and 151 is more than enough. But the cool thing is this thing has a 7,500 RPM redline and you can absolutely wind this thing out and you'll never get sick of it. It just sounds so good. And yeah, there is just a little bit of artificial noise being pumped into this cabin, but I can deal with it. And when I was in my NA, I was driving behind this thing and it sounds pretty good from the outside too. This exhaust system, I really dig it. Just again, this total package, this is just such a usable car. It's endlessly usable. Because the other cool thing is, you can have an absolute blast on this side of the law. I'm not even over the speed limit right now. I'm having so much fun and I don't have to worry about getting pulled over because I'm speeding because I'm not. This is a 70 zone and I'm not even doing 65. I mean, how could you argue with this car? It's so user friendly. It's so usable and it's usable in so many different ways. That is what I love. That's always been the key to the Mazda. It, it unlocks this layer of joy that not many cars do. The only one I can think of that comes close is probably the Ford Fiesta ST. If you're talking about fun this side of 50 grand, and I'd even put that at a close second compared to this thing. Both fantastic cars, but this one does have just a slight edge because of how engaging it is. Now, since we're on the topic of price and how much you're gonna spend on this thing. Well, this one I'm driving, it's the GSP. So it's about 39 grand before tax, which isn't bad at all. But then this one I'm driving, well, it does have the sport package and that gets you some Brembo brakes up front as well as these Recaro seats and a few other goodies like these BBS wheels that look fantastic. 4,400 bucks for that whole kit and then a $200 paint job on this one. That pushes this thing to right around 44 grand before tax. Again, not bad at all, but if you wanna skip all of that stuff, you can get the base version of the MX-5 for right around $35,000, which is absolutely silly for just how much fun you are going to have in this thing. But I really do think this GSP is the sweet spot in the lineup. Now, a big reason why I say that is because let's say you decide to skip the sport package, that's fine, but you still get some meaningful upgrades. There's a strut tower brace up front as well as Bilstein shocks at all four corners. This does have a unique suspension setup. And then it's also got a limited slip rear differential, which is very handy in a rear wheel drive car like this. 
That means you can chuck it around a lot more and you can actually get that power down when you want to. That part is just so amazing. Can't live without that LSD. I've got one in my NA and it's just so fantastic. But then if you add this sport package, well, again, it's only 4,400 bucks or so and you get lots of good stuff, including these Recaro seats that look great, though I will point out one slight problem for someone like me. These lower bolsters, they are quite narrow, so my thighs are actually sitting on top of them instead of inside of them. But if you're built more like my boss, you're not gonna have a problem. And the other cool thing is they are heated, and that's an issue I had with the Ford Mustang, because if you upgrade to the Recaros in that thing, you lose heated seats, which is really weird. So I'm happy to see that Mazda stuck with them in here. Now, I don't know if I need to sweeten the pot on this GSP anymore that I already have, but if you do get the base version of the MX-5, you can't get these Recaros and you don't get heated seats at all. So again, that's something to keep in mind because even on just a little bit of a chilly day, you wanna get out there in your drop top, heated seats are gonna come in handy. And speaking of drop top, now there is the MX-5 RF, so it's got that retractable roof. It's a lot more like a target top. This has the soft top because it's the classic Roadster, but it is so easy to lower this thing. Just undo this latch here, push it back with one hand, push it down and it's stuck. It's awesome. I love that you can do it so quickly because that also means if you get caught in the rain, you don't have to run around the car. And that is one problem with my car. I have that hard top, which I love. I think the look of it is fantastic, but it is a bit of a problem. If I do want to take that hard top off, I could find myself in a bit of trouble on a rainy day. So I dig how easy this thing is to take care of. Something else I like about this GSP, this is the first trip where you get headrest speakers for both the driver and passenger, which isn't only cool for listening to music, it also has a great benefit because if you have your phone hooked up to Android Auto or Apple CarPlay, that's how you hear dictated text messages. Well said, Dan. Don't forget to remind them how tall you are, please. Would you like to reply? Yes. What do you want to say? Well, I'm six foot three, but everybody knows that. Your reply to Will says, well, I'm six foot three, but everybody knows that. Ready to send it? Send it, Siri. That is amazing in a convertible to have it right in your ear like that. And the other thing is the voice recognition with the top down is absolutely amazing. I am really impressed that it's able to hear me. I mean, granted, I have the windows up and it's got this little screen between the seats, but there's not all that much wind noise down here. And that means the voice recognition isn't a problem. And same if you have somebody beside you easy enough to have a conversation. That is great. It's just a very well engineered car. Now I will say about this infotainment system, not only is it a little bit outdated in terms of the interface, but I still can't stand that you don't get to use the touch screen when the car's in motion and you're stuck using this controller down here. I know I go on about this every time I drive a Mazda and there's always some grumpy owner in the comments section that tells me it's totally fine. But here's the deal. So is cold pizza, but it's never going to be as good as the hot stuff. And that's exactly what's happening here. And I'm going to give you a prime example of just what I'm talking about. Let's say I'm out here cruising and I'm not all that familiar with where I am because, hey, that's what this car is for going out and exploring. So I wanna zoom out on my Google Maps, right? Well, since I can't tap this screen, what I have to do is scroll around with this wheel until I highlight this little icon down in the corner and then click on that and then click a bunch on the minimize to zoom out as much as I want. But here's the catch. If I don't scroll all the way back up to the done button, yeah, it's not gonna move with me. That is just ridiculous. And I'm telling you right now, it is way more distracting having to use this, especially in a situation like that, than if I were just able to tap the screen a couple times and off I go. I get it, you guys wanna defend what you drive, but this is just dumb. I also understand that Mazda did this in the name of safety, but it's just not good. It's time for a change. Mazda's moving in the opposite direction. It's adding these touch screens that are disabled in more cars and it's actually getting rid of touch altogether with these big 10 and a quarter inch screens that look great but they're not touch responsive at all that's just not good not in 2021 
you really do need touchscreens in order to stay competitive. But whether you agree with me or not, one thing you definitely will agree with me on is there's just no way you're gonna have any more fun in a car this side of 50 grand and maybe even more. To recap, I love how endlessly usable the MX-5 is, the fantastic manual transmission, and how focused it is as a driver's car. I don't like the infotainment controller, but that's about it. Let's be honest with each other, there isn't much left to be said about this car that hasn't been echoed over and over again over the 32 years or so since it first came out. That right there was a triumph of engineering fun and affordability, and so is this 2021 version. The biggest difference between these two is that this one's even better.